Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Love Fruit Podcast. And um, we've got another fantastic episode today. And today we are interviewing Frederick Paternode. I'm going to read a little bit about Fred, just um, about Frederick, sorry, as an introduction. He's a health author, activist, and blogger. He's been writing and publishing about health and nutrition since the age of 18 and been playing a, a big part in the or was playing a big part in the raw foods movement uh, from 1998 onwards, has published many books, um, a lot of great books. One of them, The Raw Food Controversies, a uh, very fascinating book, and um, a lot of other great information. His website's fantastic as well. If you've ever looked at his blog, lots of great inf of information there as well. So uh, I met Frederick at the Woodstock Fruit Festival a number of years ago, and uh, Actually, we kind of got lost on a on a, a hike. I'm not sure if you'll remember that, but, but we were in a group and we, we, we got lost. But um, Frederick, is there anything else you'd like to say just to introduce yourself a little bit? Well, I, I think that was that was a good introduction. Um, maybe I'd like to add that um, I've kind of maybe disappeared a little bit in the last few years. And the way you de described my, uh, my career is was accurate, but I'm not that involved anymore in the raw food movement. I wouldn't even call myself a raw foodist sure, uh, sure. right now, but I, I'm still a vegan. And um, it's been a big part of my life, but I, I, I've, I've moved, not, moved on in a, in a certain way, uh, like many people, I think, but it was still a big part of my life. And it's still, part of me <laughs> in a way so uh, and uh, and just to to put things in perspective so yes I started when I was 18 um not writing though uh about this but researching but uh I started publishing a newsletter a few years later and now I'm 45 so you know it occupied all of my 20s and 30s um, so yeah, so looking forward to to this. Excellent. Well, I I, I guess firstly we like to talk to people about you know your upbringing and how you ended up uh, sort of going towards a raw food diet at, at, at that time and were you brought up in a kind of conventional diet or or anything like that and and, and where were you brought up? So I grew up in Quebec in a very uh, francophone uh, part of the province. And uh, yes, my diet was very, very traditional. I would say similar to an American diet. Um, but my mom became a vegetarian or became interested in a vegetarian diet at some point. And I was at, yeah, so at the age of 18, I decided to go, uh, I tried veganism, it didn't work initially, but I, um, I tried to go on a vegetarian diet after reading Diet for a New America by John Robbins. And it was a big revelation. I read everything I could about it. And I felt settled in this diet. Vegetarian it was not very popular at the time, even just being a vegetarian mm -hmm. in Quebec, at least. And uh, then I discovered uh, the, the raw food diet through natural hygiene, but it was an accident. It was just through reading books on the topic that I found more extreme books that were describing things that I didn't even think were possible, like fasting and uh, eating, uh, living on a raw food diet. And that caught my attention and I, I went in that direction and I got caught in the hype of the raw food diet. Uh, ended up moving to California in a certain way where I lived it, going there and traveling for, for a while and working with David Wolf of Nature's First Law when this company was just starting. And the vibe at the time was very, uh, very extreme, almost like cultish, cult-like, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, at the time I had a few experiences that I attributed to the diet. So I got pretty sick on a no number of occasions. Once was an accident, once was actually a kind of a mysterious sickness. 
And my only way of reasoning through it was understanding it as I didn't do the diet properly. Uh, so it was very confusing to me at the time because I was expecting great results, but then my health was really suffering. And it turns out the way I understand it now is had nothing to do with the diet necessarily. So maybe we'll, we'll get into that. And sure. It doesn't really matter. But uh, the point is that I viewed everything through the lens of diet. So, you know, if I wasn't feeling right, it was the diet. And, and, um, and then I started questioning this, this belief that I had that this raw food diet would, be, would lead to perfect health. And that led me into other directions and eventually to other types of raw food diets, like a, a low fat fruitarian diet or fruit based diet, like a dark grams diet mm -hmm. and things like that. So I explored many paths, but it was always because I was not satisfied with the results that I was getting mm -hmm. initially. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and, I know that um, I feel that because you were a French speaker, you were reading maybe different material than a lot of people traditionally read who are in the US, Canada, and, and English speaking countries. Um, but what were the, you talk about natural hygiene. I think it's quite interesting that, as far as I can see, if you look kind of back, because now the real big thing, I suppose, is, is the plant based movement or the, the vegan plant based thing. That's really exploding and growing. And, um, but it feels like maybe back in the past or what that wasn't really around so much, uh, but natural hygiene was a big thing at one time kind of thing, the raw foods was, um, but what was it, what were the natural hygiene books you came across and were some of them in French as well, or what was? Yes, yes. So I read everything I could in English or in French. Uh, and there was an author, uh, Albert Mosseri who uh, grew up in Egypt, moved to France, and wrote many books that were fascinating. So uh, this material was not available in English, was not known in English. And uh, I came across it. And so I think that gave me a, a bigger perspective because he wrote a lot. And then through Mosseri's work, I discovered uh, other books, Shelton's books, et cetera. I also saw a bigger picture because I, I don't want to get into this, but some people in the raw food movement use other people's material without permission. So let's not say more about this, but I was already aware of this because Mosseri had translated this material into French. And so I knew that where many ideas were coming from originally, then they were not original. Yeah. I knew the history of it too, because like the raw food diet has been around for since the, the 19th century, pretty much mm -hmm. in Germany, it started. So these movements uh, have been around for a long time, but also I, I think this perspective of reading these books, when I got to the point of really questioning the parts of this philosophy that didn't work, that were pretty inaccurate. Uh, I understood the, the historical perspective of it. For example, the rejection of all medicine. So that, that's been around for a long time. And you have to understand that when natural hygiene was created, medicine at the time was very primitive. In fact, it was, it was almost dangerous because they were prescribing uh, drugs that, that were killing people on, or, um, I mean, it was in a very primitive state. Uh, and a lot of things were never, had never been discovered. Yeah. For example, was... disease transmission, things like that. They didn't understand these things at the time. So the, the hygiene philosophy was based on uh, a more natural way of treating disease that, that wasn't hurtful. And, but it didn't really evolve past that point uh, and take into account all the development that came later. So some people 
uh, hung on to that theory without realizing that, well, maybe, you know, it's no longer accurate in some ways, I'm saying in some ways, but yeah. the diet part was, was very visionary of saying, you know, there's, you could change your diet and then get health, uh, improve your health in many ways that people didn't think were possible. Yeah, and I think that people probably don't have an idea of the impact that hygiene had if you go back to them, because I, I, what I've heard and what I've heard some people say is that the number of hygienic places like solariums and those type of hospitals were, were almost just as popular as the, the medicine uh, at the, if you go way back like hundreds of years um, yes and and people forget like hygiene is there's a lot of common things that we see as common sense now like uh in the i think in the medicine in the medical world at one point they would put people in dark rooms because they thought that like fresh air and sunlight was bad for them in some way so they'd be putting people in dark rooms the doctors weren't cleaning their instruments weren't cleaning their hands um you know, and, and so people going out of these smoke-filled cities that people used to live in to be in the fresh air, yes, to get some sunlight and to rest, like was made. It makes a lot of sense, but it wasn't really um, that wasn't really part of the medical thing at the time. And uh, so I think hygiene, people don't realize the impact it had. And it's still it's still a bit like that today in, in Germany and. I'm not sure about the other countries, but you can take a sort of a paid medical leave, if I'm not mistaken, where you go to a, a center that is very similar to a fasting center, mm. but it's not a complete fast. It's like a health retreat where you eat a, yeah. almost like a fasting diet and you stay there for a week or two and you know, there are yoga classes, I, I imagine, things like that. But it's, it's the idea behind this has been around for a long time. And, and, and previously, uh, there were fasting centers. And fasting centers are, are much more popular in Europe, uh, but in maybe not in a pure hygienic way, but in a different way. So yes, you, you're right to have a big impact. Yeah, and um, the I, I know that with with yourself well first I'm, I'm so interested in how you got so captivated and interested in the idea you know at such a young age and i think that from hearing you talk before that you there's a story that you took a bus ride from canada to california or something like this uh to and, and relocated there to kind of be be more part of the the raw food scene i suppose and and is that is that kind of a good picture of how that happened yeah well well when I started doing this, I suddenly isolated myself from the rest of the world in Quebec and my friends. So I felt like if I wanted to go in that direction, I needed to be with people. And I just completed. So in, 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 in Canada or in Quebec, at least, college is kind of broken up into two parts. So uh, sort of like a two year degree followed by a three-year degree, and that gives you a, a bachelor's program. Uh, so I completed the first part in music. And then I didn't know what I, wanted, what, I, what, what I wanted to do after. So that's when I took the trip to California and uh, ended up being a longer trip than expected. Um, so um, yeah, I, I just... I had very little money and I just decided to go there and um, meet the people in this movement, which turns out I was, I, I was shocked by what I saw. Essentially, if you read my book, Raw Food Controversies, you'll, you'll get the whole story. But, uh, you know, I expected people that were, that had principles that were following the diet. And then I discovered human beings with a lot of flaws and inconsistencies and things that they were doing that were in contradiction to what they were saying and and all kinds of crazy people to be honest um, and I was one of those people for a while <laughs> you know so but uh, but when I say crazy uh, 
I'm not using the word lightly, like people that thought they could live on air and were, you know, getting other people to, 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 to get into this lifestyle of breatharianism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the so-called breatharians that were found, uh, caught uh, at a fast food joint, you know, yeah, yeah. crazy things like that, <laughs> crazy things like that. So I was a bit shocked by this because I was expecting kind of what I was expecting didn't exist, you know? What was wow? What what was that raw food scene in California? Was it based around some restaurants? Did did uh, I know that David Wolf and, and like they did they have like a publishing company at the time? Did they have? Yes, a they had a company? publishing company, and there were many uh, potlucks all over California in the late nineties, early two thousands, mm -hmm. and uh, at some point, a huge number of raw food restaurants. Most of them are closed down by now, but. Like a pretty uh, it's a pr surprising number, maybe not in 1999, but there was Giuliano's restaurant in San Francisco, which was a big hub. And Giuliano was was a crazy, crazy character, R really fun <laughs> guy, but really outrageously uh, eccentric. Uh, so it was all you know, potlucks, things like that, uh, conferences. Uh, a few restaurants and uh, health retreats, mm -hmm. you know, in Hawaii, here and there. So that's kind of what was happening. You would go to the these potlucks and meet people, and that's, you know. Yeah, and and um, did you kind of find yourself working with anyone, or did you just start your own thing, or how how did that? Well, work? I started I started working with uh, David Wolf's company. And then I had the idea of publishing a newsletter for them, which ended up being my own thing later, Justine and Apple, it was called. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so, and then I, um, at some point I moved to um, Arizona, worked for a while with Gabriel Cousins at his place. I worked, I, I stayed in the San Francisco area for a while. So I, so I was kind of, kind of this nomadic, bohemian guy in the raw food world just finding work here and there and starting my trying to start my own thing and when i got back to, to canada then i really started my own uh, business grew my website uh independently yeah the, the raw food controversies book which i have i think i've read most of it i, I might have read the whole book actually um you do talk a lot about some of the stories of some of the, the things happening there and the, and and some of the characters and stuff and um it does sound you're kind of you're kind of painting a picture of almost becoming a little bit dis disillusioned by it and sort of yes yeah, well it was almost a therapy to write this book like i felt <laughs> like i needed i'm gonna write this story down otherwise i'll forget it <laughs> so i thought I, it's a crazy I would because I was I would tell my ex-wife at the time I would tell her what happened in California and she she'd tell me you get it you have to write this down this is like like a novel like this is a crazy story yeah and uh, so it's almost like I wrote it more for myself like I needed to get it out there get it out of my system yes yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun book um uh, what what was the kind of philosophy well the, the dietary approach at the time because i know that you know raw foods became natural hygiene was always quite a pure diet and but the raw food movement and i think the the 90s that you're talking about went towards more the started, started to go towards more superfoods supplements and things like that and, and that's maybe part of the the business mm. of it but what was what was the common thing that the way that people were eating the diet at that point? I think every everything was was out there. So you know, they were the natural hygienist. Initially, David Wolf was eating this very pure, I mean, no seasonings, nothing uh, diet, raw food diet. So he was more obsessed with being, you know, eating raw. That was the thing that was important to uh, to him. But there were, you know, no superfood, things like that, but there were people doing all kinds of supplements like David Job in uh, New York City. Uh, Gabriel Cousins had a big program. Some people were doing juice fasting. Some people were doing uh, water fasting through the influence of hygiene. But the only thing that I 
I wish had found at the time, but that was out there, but I just didn't find it was, uh, was the AD 1010 dive or, or Doug Graham's dive. He was there, but he was, I guess his work wasn't uh, widely known at the time. So I didn't find his coming, yeah. run into his uh, work until later. Was he a best and then, um, Yeah, so this, uh, everything was, was, was out there pretty much. Right, right. Was was Doug Graham a bit of an outcast? Bit of a was. Well, you're saying you're saying that his work wasn't really known, but I was wondering if he was kind of seen as a little bit different or a little bit like not. I think later when he really uh, made a big, big splash with his eighty ten ten diet book, but at the time, you know, like in, around the year two thousand, we just. I didn't know about him. I, I'd seen an advertisement somewhere about his place in, uh, I think, Marathon, Florida, and I knew he had a fasting center. So I kind of knew who he was, but, you know, he wasn't out there on the internet. Like, uh, yeah. he didn't have an online presence at the time. So, so I, I didn't know what, about him, but, you know, I could have found out. It's just, I was in California at the time, so it was, you know, it was the information, the internet was, was, was happening, but it was not like today, not as fast. So, um, yeah. So obviously things went more online uh, since then, uh, or a, a lot of stuff did. Back then, was it more like live events and people giving talks and selling books and what, what were people trying to do at the, at the point to to sort of spread this information and try and make a bit of a uh, yeah lots of books lots of live events lots of uh, festivals for a while you know in the early 2000s there was the uh portland festival kind of like a big raw food festival so actually a lot of things were happening i would say much more than today in terms of like the raw food diet yeah and uh and then bulletin boards you know like the ancestor of forums and now social media but uh these these forums were were wild also like where you know people that's where people exchange ideas and arguments about the diet and so in, when I got to California, the big war was between the raw meat eaters and the, the pure vegans Oh wow! in terms of raw food. So there were a lot of people, and you don't hear that today anymore, mm -hmm. like, but people were proponent, proponents of eating raw meat, uh, but like huge amounts in some cases. And I, I think that may still be around with the carnivore diet, you know, but it's it's not that popular and there was a guy named Argenus von der Planets that's mm -hmm. actually his name he had a book he was out there in California so he's kind of like a like an anti-vegan that's yeah. his diet was absolutely crazy like uh it was like rotten he, meat as well it wasn't just like it, well also quarts of whole milk and right entire uh sticks of butter <laughs> and things like that and then raw meat even things that are definitely not advisable to eat raw like i'm not sure about this but i think raw chicken yeah yeah um and uh crazy things like that and he was claiming that he had cured a bunch of diseases through this um he eventually died i think but from an accidental death yeah. in Ireland or something. So uh, so that was out there. And that's what I'm saying. It was pretty wild. So at that time, like you, it seems that like you were disappointed by some of the people. Was, was anyone particularly impressed you? Was there anyone that you really uh, admired or thought was taught you anything or was a good mentor or anything like that? Uh, but there was David, uh, David Klein, mm -hmm. uh, who had a natural hygiene newsletter. So it was kind of leading the way in the right direction, but the missing piece for the diet to work was really uh, the macronutrient breakdown that 
uh, that the gram sorted out. Yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, that's that's more my focus today. So when I sure, said sure. earlier that not that concerned about raw foods anymore, I'm still concerned about the macronutrient breakdown. So I'm aiming at 80, 10, 10 in this in the caloric ratio. You know, more or less. Sometimes it's even less than that in terms of fat. It might be five percent. Sometimes it's a bit more. But that, I'm kind of aiming in that direction. So to me, that that makes the most sense. And then whether it's raw or not is really up to you know personal preference. Um, but yeah, I think that I think that anyone's anyone that's experienced high, like high high fat, low fat, all these different styles. I think that anyone would um, agree that if your choice was the an 80, a low fat cooked vegan diet or a high fat raw diet, and you had to do one of those for life, there's, yeah. no, there's no doubt that the the low fat diet of any of any kind will always be superior. I I feel. Um, I, I agree. I agree. And I would. I don't have anything against the the. The raw food diet and done in a sort of 80 10 10 way i just think it's not that practical i think it's very few people will be able to do it yesterday i went to the fruit store where i used to buy a lot of fruits back then mm. not at that time but a little bit later and uh i used to fill my uh, the trunk of my car for uh, like cases with cases of mangoes things like amazing stuff amazing produce really and you know with the most it would cost me was 150 175 dollars now prices for the same kind of produce good produce has doubled if not tripled from the from that time mm. i mean this year is is a bit uh strange i was told that you know uh they don't have anyone to pick the fruit in California or not enough people. So the trucks are, are leaving half empty. Wow. They're still paying for, for transportation. Yeah. So, you know, eating this diet for people living not where the fruit grows, it's going to be extremely expensive. <laughs> Let's be honest about it. Extremely expensive. Uh, if you want a good variety. And so it's, you know, I feel it's not very practical to, to say, to everyone they have to eat a fruit-based low-fat diet when all of the benefits almost come from the macronutrient breakdown of low fat and being vegan so that's what i think now but i'm not against it you know i don't see anything wrong with it in terms of if you do it right yeah and, and so the next part of your story you went to you went back to canada and you started the newsletter um what was what was that like as a, as a process? Was that quite a difficult, challenging thing to do at the time? Uh, well, it started very naturally, but I had a period of time, I would say, between... So I, I was growing my, my email list and my newsletter, um, and it really started... Things really started to, to gain momentum around 2004. And... You know, between I would say 2004 and 2010 or 12, that's that was like like my peak in this movement in terms of popularity and productivity. I was I was producing an incredible number of of books and uh, newsletters and things like that. You know, publications and uh, and the reason is I was inspired by uh, teaching what was wrong with extreme like the raw food diet done the wrong way yeah and explaining a better way of doing it and i was kind of filling a niche that nobody else was filling in two ways first the information although you know of course doug graham and other people were doing it but i had the advantage of having studied internet marketing and understanding how it worked at the time when nobody else was doing it, or very few people were doing it. Yeah. But so it, it was had a, an advantage over other people in terms of being able to build an audience fast. Yeah. Were you always sort of entrepreneurial like that, or was that just something you kind of learned along the way? Uh, well, no. I, I, 
I was always, yes, I was always like that because that's how kind of my adult life started. And I had the inspiration of my father who was an entrepreneur. Right. So I kind of had it in the back of my mind that I, I didn't want to follow, let's say, a normal career path, mm -hmm. which is not something I recommend to everybody, by the way. But, <laughs> but so what I'm doing now is I'm, 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 I'm kind of picking up where I left years ago because I realized I'm I'm kind of done with this thing I want I want to uh to do something else um with my life and career I'm still maintaining my email list and things like that but I'm simplifying it and in fact I'm going to make an announcement soon where I mean if you sign up for my list like you'll have to resubscribe to a new list which will be very simple I'm not going to bombard people with emails. I'm going to send very valuable content, but less often. Mm. And so that I can do that part-time. And I went back to school. I went back to university to uh, complete uh, a degree in languages. So very modern languages, various languages, which is, a and I'm, I'm, I'm teaching that. So I'm, I'm going in, in a very uh, different direction with my career. Uh, but that's where I am, you know, with, <laughs> with, with my life. But I had a big run in, in the raw food movement for a while. Excellent, yeah. Um, you, you mentioned, obviously, w w I, I, have you got a little bit of time left? Or we yeah, 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 yeah. You mentioned, obviously, well, um, how, how popular did your, the, I know you did a physical newsletter at one point. How popular did that get? How many copies were you sending out at one point? Uh, well, the, the newsletter was just in an Apple was only until 2003, I think. So it was very niche, you know, we had a couple thousand subscribers, but it was not like in the tens of thousands. So it was very, uh, very niche, you know, for people interested in that topic. And then um, it's more the email newsletter later on, but Things are very different now. So uh, if you had a newsletter of 10,000 people in 2005, that's like the equivalent of 100,000 today, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, so now the, everything is very diluted. Yeah. People don't follow one person. Mm -hmm. So if you're on YouTube, you have to create new videos every day, otherwise people lose interest. But uh, at some point, people still had some kind of capacity for focused attention, which has been totally destroyed now by social media and smartphones. But uh, so you could follow something, you could, you know, you had some control over your email box. You would receive newsletters that you really wanted. But now it's just, there's just so many things going on, podcasts, things that, sure. I mean, who follows just a few people mm -hmm. and, and, I mean, there are a few people like that that I follow, but there are very few. Yeah. You know, overall, yeah. Yeah, the, and interesting. And um, uh, you, so you you discovered kind of more the Doug Graham style at one point, and um, I'm interested to know, were you did you were you aware of him before the eight to ten ten book came out, and did you play? I, I mean, I always feel like. That book really, it feels like it really got out there, you know, and I imagine there was probably a number of people helping that message get out there. I was, I was wondering if you played a part in helping that message get out to other people as well. Maybe in a way, because I, 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 I met him a few years before he published his book. Mm -hmm. So uh, I knew him when he was developing the concepts and so I've written the book Raw Secrets, which was kind of uh, going in that direction. So the only thing I didn't have was, was the exact number. It's like 80%, yeah. 10% fat, 80% carbohydrates. But in Raw Secrets, I was already telling people that you know, they were eating too much fat and, and that especially nuts and seeds. Yeah. Uh, and they needed to focus on on fruit so um so that was the message and, and doug graham liked my book uh and I, I i 
met him before I had my book out and then we were in touch and we, we did a number of programs. Uh, we did the perfect health program together. And I, I went to all of his live events for a while. I did his fasting retreat. I did his uh, health and fitness week, uh, his walking tour of Costa Rica. And the book came out, if I'm not mistaken, after, after that. Uh, so I was kind of like, I, I didn't write, I didn't contribute anything to the book, but I saw the, the development of this book and, and then the aftermath. Yeah. And um, uh, the, the Perfect Health Program, how did, how did that come together? I've, I've listened to that a few times. Uh, well, that was kind of when my internet business was booming. And then uh, that was the same year where I did all the, uh, pro all the events that Doug Graham was doing. So I did the fasting retreat. I did the other programs. And I told him we could do something together, create this live event initially. Then we would turn it into uh, CDs or MP3s and we just get it out there so it was pretty ambitious because we did 12 one-hour conferences for 12 days in a row for people who sign up for the live event every night of the week from so for almost two weeks uh, so yeah so, so so it was also a, a kind of format that wasn't really out there at the time it's funny like, because a lot of people are still doing that now you know there's a lot of conferences like that that happen uh, I think my friend Ken and Johnny, he innovated the, the concept more of, uh, of the um, live event with multiple speakers. Right. Like the, what's the name that, <laughs> I haven't signed up for one in a while, but basically the, the same thing. Yeah. Like a, a summit, summit, a summit, yeah. Like a live summit with 10, 12, 20 speakers and it's going to last for a while and then everyone promotes to their list and then it's, so it's, it's also a marketing concept mm -hmm. uh, but it, those are very popular so i didn't really uh, invent that but i'm pretty sure that kevin johnny and some of his friends were some of the first uh, people to do this uh, but the the teleconference i imported that idea from other uh, other marketing groups so it wasn't being used in raw foods and natural health like no one was doing that really but i had taken the idea from people who were doing things like that for marketing groups awesome and um so where when did you kind of start to change or or move away from raw foods or um put less focus on it what what was what was that what what led you towards that kind of decision it was it was a very long very long process uh you know i can't really summarize it because i mean i think i described it in uh in raw food controversies from the start until the end pretty much but it you know it started my disillusion in the first few years of the raw food diet then came a few years of searching then the 80 10 10 diet at some point but i never i managed to do it for a while for a number of years but not forever uh, so that's kind of you know i tried back and forth different things and eventually realized mcdougall dr esselstyn all of these people were kind of going in the in the same direction and that I could follow that, you know, and adapt it to in my own way. So, so that's kind of when all the theories merged into one for me. And um, so you've been mentioning that you've been doing, uh, you've been going back to education, uh, learning uh, languages and so on. Um, so is that, is that what you're mostly kind of been focusing on at the moment in your life? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not learning new languages. I, I learned a bunch of languages in my 20s, but I'm now I'm uh, basically uh, acquiring extra skills around that. Mm. Uh, 
through education and, and, and to, in order to make a, a, like a new career out of it. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I've been doing for, for the last couple of years. And I think at one point, maybe I'm wrong with this, but you were also at one point coaching people who wanted to start their own uh, in online business. I'm not sure if you stopped. Yeah, I did that for a while. Yes. Uh, yes. So I did, <laughs> I did a lot of things online. Um, but yes, at some point I was coaching people to uh, how to make a living in the natural health movement. Mm. What, what I, I, I think now things are so different, you know, like even the, the word influencer is, is relatively right. recent. And I feel now if you want to do this, it's you, you have to have much more uh, realistic goals. It's much more difficult to make this work, to, to right. make a living out of a podcast or a YouTube channel. I mean, you can't, but it's a lot of work. It's, I mean, it's always been a lot of work, but it's even more work now because of the way information is consumed and loyalty to a brand and how much output you need and yeah. the attention span, all the, you know, some of the things I talked about, but yes, it's, yeah, so I, I, I wouldn't teach it now because it's not the same thing now. Yeah. I think that like, there's a lot of, um, a lot, what I see with the raw food movement now, a lot of the time is people come into it and they very quickly, some, some people have particular personalities or they have a uh, certain charisma or attractiveness or whatever it is. And they become very popular very quickly. The, all of a sudden they're whatever, very popular speaking at events and all these other things. And then a month later, they're no longer interested in the diet anymore. And, uh, and they, <laughs> Like on YouTube, for example. It happens all the time. Yeah, it's like, yeah. you know. Um, but but are you a, a fruitarian? Or are you a beat, a fruit-based diet? Yeah, I mean, I I follow kind of 80 10, 10 as well. Okay, yeah. You know, low fat. Um, and basically followed the, that idea. But I have, I have made mistakes on the raw food journey and eating more nuts and things. Not, not really not really by choice, but just when you start eating nuts, you kind of can't stop sometimes. <laughs> and then, uh, so I've tried all that, um, but mostly going towards a simpler fruit-based diet. And uh, I, I, that's, that's why I, I do like that. And I think the, the thing that, the advantage for me is I'm quite happy with the simplicity of it. And I think some people are a little bit disappointed by the fact that maybe a lot of the year they've only got five or six or seven different fruits really that are available to them all the time whereas i'm kind of okay with that like i i, I kind of yeah um, yeah i mean it's important that uh that that it works for you and uh when you know i think we have a certain a limited amount of willpower to do these things and i at some point you gotta settle into something you can't forever try new diets you know <laughs> so sure so that's why you know i kind of landed where i landed but now my my desire to try something new is very low because yeah, yeah. I've, I've done that for so long and it's it's, <laughs> it's just it just burns you out you know when you so at some point you get a, okay so this this is what i'm going to do and then if it's a, a fruit-based diet, it's a fruit-based diet, and you just do it, you know. Yeah, you, I remember you giving a great presentation at, at, at Woodstock. Uh, you were at Woodstock uh, one time, and you gave a pre presentation about teeth, which I think was pretty important. Yeah. Um, I think still, still people have issues with teeth, uh, with eating a lot of, I, I think a lot of it's dried fruit. I think a lot of people eat too much, like dates and things. Um, and... Uh, you were a great. You 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 give great presentations and things. Do you, do you miss doing that? You're very good at it. Mm, I I don't miss talking about diet and nutrition. Yeah. You know, so I feel now I I feel I've said everything I wanted to say about yeah. it. But 
but I'm enjoying, you know, talking about this and reminiscing. Uh, but um, but to talk a little bit about tea, that 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 was also a big uh, a big point. Yeah, a turning point for me. That's I realized I I gotta make this work for for my teeth if I'm going to get keep getting cavities on this diet. This is not going to work. So that's one of the things that made me really question uh, this diet. But yeah, yes, there's the fruit and all that. I'm going to say something controversial maybe to some people, but I think going too natural is is a mistake. Like brushing your teeth, you know, with uh, just water. I mean. <laughs> You got to you got to use the fluoride toothpaste. <laughs> Let me be clear about that. You got to use the fluoride toothpaste. Some people don't like it, but it works. You know, it really works at protecting your enamel. And so it's not just the diet. It's also that people tend to do this diet. They they give up a lot of you know modern stuff like a fluoride toothpaste. And so that was the big thing for me. Is uh, or you got to keep brushing your teeth. Some people stop brushing their teeth entirely. Uh, and have a good, you know, very good hygiene. Uh, but yeah, maybe uh, I still eat dates. I still eat dried fruits, not, in, you know, as much as before, but I, I don't worry about it anymore. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So I guess how would, if, if people want to find out more about you or want to contact you for anything or your website, where, where would people where would people go? Well, they can go to uh, to my website, uh, frederickpatmov.com uh, or renegadehealth.com. And then both websites have a uh, have a link where you, you can send me an email. So in order to simplify things, I've kind of reduced my presence on social media. Mm -hmm. So before I had, you know, Facebook and Instagram, but send me an email there. I'm likely not going to get it. So... If you if you go to the website and just send me an email from the website, that that's the simplest way to to contact me, and you can see what I have there. Yeah, and I I I recommend your books. They they're a great read. Um, the ones that I particularly talk about, the raw secrets and the raw controversies, are both really fun books and well really well written. You you've always been a fantastic writer and. Um, I still get, um, I was, I started getting some emails from you not that, not that long ago. I think I was on someone else's email list somehow and, and maybe you took it over or something. I'm not sure what it was, but um, you, I, I, I think your stuff's excellent. Like I've never I've read stuff that you've put out there. It's always really well written and, uh, you know, really well put together. So it's, it's, it's good stuff. Um, but thanks for taking the time. Thanks. To thanks. Me. Thanks for, for the comments. <laughs> <laughs> appreciating but yeah those two books if you will read that's pretty much that summarizes what i have to say and i don't i don't know if you remember um the the story i was saying at the start at woodstock fruit festival what happened was there was a group of cars that were meant to go to a particular point for a hike and when we got to your car all of the other cars had disappeared like very, very quickly. And it was very strange how quickly they'd gone. We didn't it's, know. It's very strange. Okay. So something strange is happening to me in terms of uh, this period of time. Like there's so much was going on in my life that I, I, I vaguely remember this. <laughs> I, you got, it was I remember more before. like the conferences that I gave and all of that stuff and, and the hike with you, but the, the part about the car, just that we, uh, we lost our way. Yeah. That's, <laughs> what, what happened was the other cars had left. We then went set out to try and find them or catch them. And I don't think we ever did. So we went on our own hike. We went on a separate hike <laughs> to everyone else. And then um, we, I've got quite a good memory, but this maybe it's probably more significant for me. It's like my first raw food event and everything. Um, and I think that we stopped off at a market on the way back, uh, a fruit market or something. But yeah, uh, I just thought I'd fill people in if they were wondering what I was talking about at the start. No, no, I no, that's a good story. Yeah, yeah. So when, when you first told me about it, I, like when you emailed me, I I didn't remember you from from that time because it's been like. Almost ten years now, you know, 
And that was like my last raw food event. I haven't gone to another raw food event since, you know? Mm. So, uh, so I've, like I said, I've been a bit disconnected from everything up, uh, in, you know, in terms of like raw foods and, uh, but, uh, yeah, so they're sure. great memories. Sure. Um, you, you used to do a bit of travel as well. I think you've traveled around a lot of places. What, what was your experience with travel and was it was there places that you enjoyed more as a raw fitter at the time or places that were more difficult or what what were your uh, experiences with that yeah the thing about yeah traveling uh well now it's very difficult <laughs> to be traveling but i'm glad i did it at, at the time so I, I i traveled a lot at some point i, I went on a trip around the world which would also combine with conferences in different uh different cities and, and so when i met you those those were around, around the end of, of kind of that journey and uh so that's why so many things were happening but um yeah the, the, so there are places that are just great to visit and then there are places that are great to visit if you happen to be a raw foodist or a fruitarian and of course i mean it's, it's not going to be a surprise but uh, i would say definitely southeast asia is the most uh, friendly if you want to have a, a huge variety of fruits at, at an incredible uh, price uh, and exotic fruits like places like Thailand and Bali. You know, I haven't been to to some of the more remote places that people go when they go hunt for for durian, like uh, some of the islands in Indonesia. But apparently, um, but. These are not the places that I like the most. I really like from every place that I visited in the world. I love Italy, Greece, and the islands in the South Pacific. So that, that's kind of my, like my vibe. Yeah. Uh, but it's not, yes, it's not, not the same degree of raw food friendliness. Well, thanks. Just thanks a lot for giving me time today and, and for being part of the interview and everything. And um, I encourage everyone to head over to Amazon or whatever and get the books, Raw, Raw Secrets, Raw Controversies. And there's a number of recipe books and things you've got, I'm sure are very helpful for people as well. And um, frederickpatternod.com for more information. Uh, any any last words of wisdom or thoughts towards the <laughs> uh, Brush your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh... Keep it low fat and, and you'll be good to go. <laughs> Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for listening. Please feel free to share and uh, pass this around. Give it a rating, comment, feedback, whatever you want to do. And head to fruitfest.co.uk to find out more about the festival. And we'll see you in another episode of the Love Fruit Podcast. Thank you.